What's up, what's up, everybody? It's Danny Green here. My co-host, Harrison Sanford, back inside the green room, brought to you by Jack in the Box. But before we get to our interview, Harrison, let us know what we got. Yeah, we have a stacked roster for today's episode. Chine Agumake, who plays in the WNBA and also a media personality for ESPN, is joining us. Then we have Ross Stripling from the LA Dodgers to talk about the MLB's return to play, which might be difficult, to say the least. Then comedian Mike Epps joins, on, joins with us as well to give us some uh, humor and some comedic flavor. And then we end the episode with one of Danny's personal stylists to see um, how we could all try to implement some of his drip, for lack of a better phrase. Right. Before we, <laughs> but before we get to that, Chine, thank you for joining us. And before we even talk about the WNBA and talk about your role in the media, more than anything, how are you doing and how are your friends and your family handling uh, this current COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, um, thank you for checking in on me. It's been strange, but you know, I think first and foremost, as athletes, a lot of times people look to us as celebrities, you know, as influencers and all that type of stuff. Um, this has really shown who the real superheroes are. Mm -hmm. So just being able to lay low and help out in our ways by staying home has been really nice. So we always salute those first responders, the grocery store workers, the trash men and women, like that's one reason why I've been super staying low, like just very grateful and trying to stay safe. Second reason is because for a long time, my life has been a little bit of crazy. You know, I have two full-time jobs. And so like leading into, you know, before everything's were shut down, I was pretty much on a cross country flight two to three times a week working for ESPN and then two to three times a week in the WNBA. So this has allowed me to like reset, recover, recharge, recalibrate, all the re's, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> Just that's get my balance back. And so um, it's been weird not working, but at the same time, it's like, I don't think we'll ever, ever have this chance again. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to just stay present. <clears throat> and that, that leads me into my next question. Um, you've been there for some time now, and that's definitely something that I might want to get into. And maybe one day, I don't know if I want to work for ESPN behind the scenes, but um, eventually work for a network and, you know, get some insight on behind the scenes. How has it been? What's the experience like for you before this? And then obviously tell us what it's been like to not be in the studio and not have like a technical staff and, and you know, just how the differences are um, during this time. Well, Danny, you got a job whenever you're done getting rings, okay? <laughs> I that. You're not getting your that. rings, you got a job because you're natural at this. And um, I think, you know, they just installed the home studio a couple weeks ago in my house. And I'm not going to lie, it's been nice. nice you know, fun. like, <laughs> just being able to, like, I wake up. The only thing that I've been worried about is, like, my sister actually did my braids. My big sister, Neka, who also plays with me on the spark. Ah, okay. So all these hidden homegrown talents are coming. Uh, you know what yeah, I'm yeah, for sure. Um, so, like, fortunately, my sister hooked me up with the hair. I've watched enough of YouTube to know how to do enough of my makeup. So, like, all the anxiety about doing it on my own has gone away. So I just pop in and work. And so it's been really convenient. And it's sort of reminded us, like, do we have to be doing everything we're doing face to face every day? Like, Zoom has been really great. Like, I come from a Nigerian American household. This is the first time all of us have been connected via Zoom, the ones in Nigeria, the ones in New Jersey, the ones in Minnesota and Utah. And like, so they've been nice little blessings in disguise, but when it comes to work, like the, the, home, the home change has been kind of nice um, just because we're always at a frenetic pace. But, you know, as you mentioned, getting into the TV business is sort of like, it, it happened to be super randomly. Um, you talk about Bristol, Connecticut. Boy, I lived in Bristol <laughs> five years. Let me tell you, like, it, it, as a young, I was like 22. Wait, when did I graduate? Yeah, 22 to 27, mm. I was there. And I'm telling you, I was at some work, work was lit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> work was great. Outside I of work. I'm like, where are my, where my people at? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little dry out there, huh? Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. But it was also a great platform for me. I was drafted to the Connecticut Sun. And so my, I would drive an hour and 15 minutes to Bristol to go and work. And I was able to do that simultaneously, but I was working so much that I needed to find a little bit more balance. So I was like, okay, we also have offices in LA and yeah. my sister's yeah. on the team. So let me see if I can finesse this. And I'm really grateful for Connecticut for that. But like, I never thought TV was gonna happen. It actually happened for me through, I guess you can say adversity. I got injured twice. I was playing overseas in Italy, overseas in China got injured twice. And I was like, maybe my body's not built for playing 24 seven. 
So I started saying yes to a lot of different opportunities. I will tell y'all this and y'all better not make fun of me, okay? Okay. We'll try. So my first real TV media gig, I was just so like after the injury, a lot of athletes right now are realizing, oh, this is what it's like when sports goes away. So like now I think we're going to have a, re like a, a lot of people are going to come back like with passion and like make the most of it. I, real I realized that from my injury twice, right knee, microfracture, left Achilles. And so I was like, let me just use this platform that sports has given me to the most, right? So I started saying yes to all opportunities. My first media opportunity, Pac-12 Network, because I went to Stanford. They're like, oh, come work the tournament. I was like, all right, bet. I didn't read the fine print. <laughs> and so they said, Shanae, what we're going to have you do is go on this train. We've got all the mascots, and you're going to go on there and interview the mascots. I was like, okay, fun. I was like, hold up, hold up, hold up. I got there, and I'm like, mascots don't talk. Like, <laughs> What, what am I, what am I doing? So I just started having fun and I'm um, saying yes. And one thing turned to the next and I was working some like, you know, calling women's college basketball games, then eventually working as uh, anchor for sports center Africa at ESPN. And then by then I was like, you know, I was spewing off my NBA takes here and there. This is a part <laughs> of my little African segments. And they're like, they started running on the ESPN app. Mm -hmm. And so the bosses started saying, Oh, this girl knows her stuff. And we're at a point where, you know, you're in the NBA, I'm WNBA. Basketball is basketball. Hoop is hoop. So they're like, we're going to put you on and you're going to analyze this NBA game. I was like, oh, snap. You know what I mean? <laughs> like people, I have a cool, like I have good credentials. I'm solid, but like people yeah. still don't necessarily know how to say my name, Harrison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so going on there, I was definitely intimidated. But then, you know, we always come prepared, you know, from Stanford. I'm a nerd. And from there, it blossomed into a bigger and bigger role. So it was unconventional, my path, but definitely without those injuries, I wouldn't have a great appreciation, a greater appreciation for what sports can do for me. And the crazy part is this side hustle ends up being probably the better thing for my longevity as a professional. So you're going to make that transition. And I'm sure it's going to be super smooth. I hope so. Like, I hope so. So I've never been, actually, I've never got a chance to, be to go to Br Bristol and uh, check out. Um, the office. I have a feeling you're going to go. And I have a feeling uh, you're going to Hopefully, like, hopefully soon. Like, the summer's yeah. just been busy and stuff like that. But it is convenient, though, having a podcast and double work from home. I, I do appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you know, so the, the one thing that I, I do wonder with Danny uh, going forward is, Chine, uh, Danny has sometimes, it's hard for him, or could be hard for him, to critique current NBA players. Ooh. Because obviously he's in the NBA. He's in the NBA. So I wonder for you, it's a little bit different because you're not in the NBA, but how difficult is it when you do get posed a question about the WNBA and you have to be more critical? Look, it doesn't matter if it's the NBA, the WNBA. I'm a black female on television. Once I have an opinion, people are ready to make sure I'm on point, okay? <laughs> um, but I've sort of embraced it because I think one thing is a lot of times those who are not in sports sort of lack the empathy for the process, right? Meaning like as athletes, we understand why someone might have a rough game or like why they might be in a, in a shooting slump. Like we, we get it, they're on the road. They've been on the road for how many, you know, games that the personalities in that locker room are different. Things that we have experienced and lived through, people sometimes don't have empathy. They'll just point to the stats and say, you're trash that night. And so for me, I think the, the perspective I bring whenever it says, hey, like talk about this, I always try to like give the spin of this is why it's happening. Like not just they had a poor shooting night. It's like, look, two nights ago, he played 48 minutes. And before that, they had no bench. And before that, like, trust me, I've been in that shoes. I, my jumper was flat. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so like, I think that's the perspective that typically people that have played sports or played at a high level bring when they bring analysis. And that's what makes it more acceptable. But then there are also some people that want the smoke. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they, they want to be able to move the needle. So it's just a delicate balance. It's not easy. But um, I think also having the relationships with those current players to go back and be like, hey, hey, this is what I meant. You know, I got <laughs> back. You know what I mean? For sure. That definitely helps. Because, uh, you know, some people are sensitive. Some people take offense. But, you know, you're just doing your job. You have to have an opinion. You have to. And that's the one thing that I... I wouldn't say fear, but I, I just don't like to criticize it because I know how tough it is being in any league, being a professional athlete. Um, you're going to have some ups and downs. You're going to have some rough nights. And, you know, not everybody's role is to do this, do that. So it's just tough for me to actually talk bad about anybody because I respect everybody's craft. I respect everybody that's made it into the league. Um, but going so up into the, bringing me to the next question, uh, being the vice president of the WMBPA, um, how likely is it that the season returns for the WNBA? 
Okay, let's, talk about like, oh, well, I'm gonna be nice to other. Look at you coming in with the heat, Danny. Like, <laughs> hey, look, I'm just doing my job. <laughs> I feel you. Um, so I think it's it's 50 50 just because as athletes, you know what it's like. We don't want to be out there unless it's completely safe. But we also have this moral obligation, this moral responsibility as athletes to feel like we can help uplift, uplift people that are like going through tough times right now. Some people have lost jobs. Some people are literally helping take care of our loved ones in hospitals, however. So like as athletes, we feel like, shoot, if I can go and play a game, people can sort of forget what's going on for a few minutes before they go back, they're recharged. Like, so it's sort of a tug of war spiritually for us. But I would just say, first and foremost, I am so grateful that we got our new CBA ratified because mm -hmm. the timing of that, like we got it ratified in January. Got it, you know, I, I'm not gonna take the credit. My big sis is president, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> that's huge though, it's huge for the, um, for the league. And, and I can't even imagine what we'd be dealing with if we didn't have a new agreement, just because now we have the comfort of saying, hey, like we don't have to feel pressured to go out there earlier just to make sure we capitalize on sponsorship dollars or we don't let the league hang in the balance. Like we have stability. I think it's likely that we will play. I just think it's finding the creative way for us to play. Now, we only have 12 teams in the WNBA, 144 players, 12 players per team. So like while the NBA is trying to find a way to play, ours, our, our numbers are a little bit better. It works to our advantage um, just because we don't have to deal with as many personnel. Mm -hmm. But y'all got some good resources. Like y'all got private jets, <laughs> y'all got chefs, you know what I'm saying? So like yeah. the challenges are different. But like I'm on, you know, obviously weekly calls. We're in a constant group chat where we're trying to find the creative way. So I'm very optimistic that we'll play. I just think that we have to take our cues from society and also be creative. A lot of people are looking for the WNBA to be like one of the first leagues, but we want to do it right. We don't want to put anybody at risk. So it's more like just being patient and trying to figure it out. But until then, if like the NBA, like if y'all want to let us into y'all's gym so we can work out, that yeah. would be. I mean, I'm not opposed, man. I'm, I'm all for sharing the love and sharing the space. We have more than enough space and more enough resources to, to be able to, to help out, you know, everybody that's around. If you're in the area, you know, be my guest. Jump on in. Appreciate you. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, I'm sure you're excited if the league does come back because you also do get the opportunity, potentially, to play with your sister who just got drafted. Mm. Or, get, or against her. There we go. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I didn't... You know what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it is going to be a really interesting season. So, like, honestly, we were all surprised. So, four girls in our family, all of us, we hoop. Oldest one, she's the most lit MVP champion. <laughs> I came and joined the bandwagon after five years with Connecticut. And so now we both play on the Sparks. Baby sis, Erica, you know, her name is Erima. I don't want to just like, I'm, since we're already doing my name right, it's Nemkadi Chinenya. She's so uh. and Erema, but you know, we go by Neka, Chene, Olivia, yeah. and Erica. You know? <laughs> um, <American> but Erica, <laughs> yep, Erica just got drafted to the Minnesota Lynx, which are pretty much the Sparks rival. Mm -hmm. So, we will two sisters will play against one. Um, hopefully, she is still like gonna try to fight for a roster spot, but just to have three sisters in the league, like we never, you know, it's like the baby sister, the one you don't worry about, the one that's the smallest. Mm -hmm. The one that's always doing their thing. You're like, wait, hold up. How do you mess around and get on, a, you know, get on our level? Like, what? <laughs> uh, but it's a beautiful. Working. Jenna, you know, speaking of, you know, WNBA players and what, you know, Danny was referencing his younger sister and what she might do. A lot of women in your position, they go overseas to play during the off season. How much, and I'm sure you have a bunch of friends in the WNBA, how much has COVID-19 impacted their global play and, you know, just even just the fight for fair play or a uh, fair share of WNBA uh, revenue and financial incomes that players are expecting to get when the global part of the game is also being chopped out because of COVID-19. Yeah, it's a really tough situation to be in. But I think, like I said earlier, like having this new CBA where we were creative and finding ways for people to play in our league in the WNBA has really helped. And I, talk, I say creative just because – you know, we, a lot of people make this assumption that I want Danny Green money. Yes, I want Danny Green <laughs> money, okay? But we also understand, as WNBA players, the economic realities of our league. We're not asking for Danny Green money. We're not asking for, you know, LeBron James, Steph Curry money, all of that. We don't want equal pay, per se, because we know our business. We want fair pay. 
So when people talk about percentage of revenue, what we really mean is that in the NBA, they're saying that their product, which is the best basketball of its kind, is worth about 50% of the revenue, right? As a precedent, we don't want to say women, just because they play and are women, their percentage is different because we're equally the best women's basketball league in the world. 144 women get to play in the WNBA. That is probably one of the most competitive jobs ever. It is not easy. For a lot of players around the world, first and foremost, it's, it's challenging to try to figure out like, okay, the international aspect of bringing everyone back to be ready to play for a season where you know, you could be playing on campus or in a bubble, like that's tough. And I know a lot of people are worried, but there are a lot of people that have lost their jobs in this situation. So just being able to play and get paid with our passion of basketball, like it, it's just been a blessing. But like you said, like, um, I think, you know, in our league, we're just in a pretty decent position where we've got this new CBA, we've gotten players to receive like up to almost $250,000 top players We've got the league to bet on women, invest in women with about $12 million additionally to pay to players in the off season. So like we're finding creative ways for us to hopefully have the best women's basketball league in the world where those international players don't have to feel pressured to go to Russia or China or Italy or Poland or Turkey. Like maybe you're gonna be just good playing in the WNBA just because of this new latest CBA. So we just have to be a little bit patient. We'll find a way to get everyone back playing. And I think our league, like we have a lot of momentum. A lot of people, a lot of haters don't wanna read into it. If you look at our merchandising numbers, if you look at our streaming numbers, if you look at our popularity, if you look at our social media, we're on the come up, you know what I mean? And so um, I think just knowing that that's happening, our timing is still okay. and the league is in a healthy place for everyone, not just the players here, also the players abroad. For sure, for sure. And until, I mean, that's, that's awesome. And hopefully it does happen that way. But until you get to that point, obviously you guys, a lot of your colleagues and coworkers and peers are going to be still playing overseas. Um, yeah. Unlike you, a lot of them don't stay stateside and work for ESPN. So yeah. during this time, how, how do you think it's really affecting them? I think right now it's all about mental health. You know, and I think that's one reason why we're seeing a lot of people like, let's open the gym so at least we can still do what we know to do. You know what I mean? Because for as basketball players, like if you don't touch a ball for a certain amount of time, you're gonna be like, you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> and so I think mental health is, is, is so important right now. But at the same time, women's basketball players have no break. Like we play, so our season runs from May to October, typically from October to May, you're going, you have seven to 10 days to report to your overseas team. And if you make the playoffs to go to a championship, they expect you right after that. And plus they'll incentivize you with money, right? So you're my sister, like my big sis, a lot of people ask me like, why was it so important for you to play with your big sis? Ever since my sis graduated Stanford and became a professional, I probably saw her total 14 days, 20 days in six years just wow. because she was playing in LA, then she was going to Poland, playing in LA, then she went to China, then she went to Russia for five years. So like we were stealing holidays and pockets of time. I remember for my birthday, the easiest thing for her to do was to say, Chanae, I'm gonna fly you out to London so we can meet in between my yearly games in London. We'll have two days and then we'll go out. Like wow. that's how hard women's basketball players are constantly working and how much they sort of need a break. I think we're grateful to be able to just take a deep breath and then come out when we come back like we about to ball be you know fresh. What I mean? be real fresh everybody's gonna yep. be real fresh <laughs> for sure Chene, we appreciate the time we can see you've been getting your reps and you're real good at this media stuff and not yeah. too bad at ball either i got i got a lot to learn i got i got a lot to learn before i come over to uh, you good i just see your <laughs> guest list you <laughs> you lit mike apps hello <laughs> <laughs> well appreciate the time hope everybody's good and staying safe um you're one of our best, you know, be, be, you know, I guess in Texas, I know a lot of things are more open, but you know, <laughs> social distancing, I know Houston is a party city. So, so appreciate the time and everybody, you know, give everybody our best and staying safe and, and practicing, you know, the right things that we need to do during this time. Thank you so much. I feel like because this is a safe space and, you know, typically we're supposed to be unbiased and all mm -hmm. that type of stuff. I am rooting for y'all, for y'all Lakers. I, I so appreciate that. <laughs> we had a, a good chance before all this happened, so we were rolling. But hopefully, we get back and everybody's still in shape. But um, you know, Ooh, in shape. Mm. Yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> Some guys have been working out. I mean, it's, you, you find ways to work out when you want to. But you're so right. Hopefully, hopefully, we get back. Guys aren't out of crazy out of shape where we no, can get back in shape quicker, and then you know continue to you know make the Lakers fans proud and hopefully 
get something special to happen this year. But Absolutely. Get season back first. But once again, thanks again. Um, Always. You know, have a was it what was today? Have a great rest of the week. Yeah, yeah you should don't, even, don't even know the days. I was about to say have a great week. Have, have a great rest of the week, and you know, hopefully we'll catch you soon. Thank you. Right back at you. Go Lakers. We're back with more Inside the Green Room with Danny Green. I'm Harrison Sanford. And joining us now is Ross Stripling, uh, one of the pitchers for the Los Angeles Dodgers, a previous All-Star, and could be back to All-Star form this year if MLB gets back to play. A lot for us to discuss. But first and foremost, Ross, how are you doing? And how are you and your family uh, coping with this pandemic? Yeah, what's up, guys? Well, first, thanks for having me, for sure. how we're coping with it, man. Good question. You know, at first it was, it was nice. I haven't spent a summer month home in Texas since I was in college, like nine, 10 years ago, you know, so certainly trying to make the most of it, but you know, we're, we're definitely stir crazy, staying busy for a while and, but you can only go on so many walks through the neighborhood. Right. So we're, we're looking forward to trying to get a deal done here and uh, get back to playing baseball. But man, it's uh, you know, we're used to being 50 games into our season by now. So it's certainly very different. Ross, once again, appreciate you coming on, man, taking your time out. Um, as you know, we're both kind of in the same situation. And everybody, the fans want to know, you know, you've been playing baseball your whole life. You said it hasn't been since you were 16, 17 years old to have a month at home. Um, what have you been doing to be able to stay in shape? Or have you been able to get in some baseball work or some practice? Or what have you been doing to replace the time of not being able to, to be on the field? Right. Yeah. Good question, Danny. You know, it's, it'd be interesting to know my schedule versus yours um, and, and how I'm staying in shape versus what you're doing. You know, really my baseball stuff has remained about the same. We're just doing it in smaller groups. You know, usually in the off season, we're working out maybe groups of six, eight, nine people. Uh, Mm -hmm. We've just been doing smaller groups of basically two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we were to get a shotgun call saying, yo, spring training 2.0 starts tomorrow, I'm ready. I'm, you know, still throwing off the mound twice a week. I've been um, thrown to hitters and, and stuff like that. So I'm in shape and ready to go. My workouts maybe haven't been as good as they are in a normal off season, but they're good enough to stay in shape and, and be ready. You know, we know that it could kind of happen any minute. So I've been fortunate in my situation. I know there's some guys that are having to throw into a net in their backyard or whatever, you know, and, and um, so I, I've, I've been able to stay in shape, which I'm happy about. And uh, hopefully can you know do the real thing here soon so you had equipment at your home and you're able to order some gym equipment or get some stuff sent to your house yeah so the Dodgers did a great job about that you know what what was nice about kind of how it went down for us was we saw it happen to y'all about 48 hours but before it happened in the baseball world because so we kind of had an idea it was coming so we were we had two days to jumble stuff together as best we could and, and then um, we kind of dispersed around the whole country, right? Some guys stayed in LA, some guys stayed in Arizona, but most guys went home across the country. And Arizona, where I was for spring training, was almost in denial of the whole <laughs> virus. I mean, I'll tell you what, man, it, 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 it was normal for weeks past when the rest of the country was starting to kind of really, you know, worry. And we were able to go to Target and stock up on stuff and including – gym stuff and take some stuff from the Dodgers and we put it in the car and we came home to Texas and so about three days a week I do stuff at home but I've also been able to go to a gym which um, we've faith you know we deep clean we Lysol everything after we use it and uh, it's it's been good no one has gotten sick at the gym so really you know like I kind of touched on I've been able to stay in shape as best I can that's pretty good yeah I'm jealous Arizona Arizona is still kind of denying it they're very open from what I hear yeah but uh yeah, no, it's uh, – we hope that everything is turns out well with Arizona, but it's definitely a vast difference on how they're handling it versus how things are in a place such as, you know, Los Angeles where Danny and I are right now. Uh, Ross, what can you tell us about the potential return of MLB to play? Obviously, there's a number of stipulations. Obviously, the season would have started already, so you're looking at a drastic difference in the amount of games that we played by the end of the season. What can you, what are you allowed to tell us about the process and where you guys stand now and where you hope to be in the hurdles to get there? Right. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily know much more than what the general public is reading. And, and that's mostly because there isn't much more to my knowledge. You know, I think that both sides are having a hard time coming together and getting on the same page. 
Um, you know, we've received a health and safety proposal, which talks about getting tested and using the facilities and that kind of stuff. But we, as players, our union, we have not received an economic proposal. Now, we agreed to prorated salaries back in March, uh, you know, which means if we play half our games, we get half our salaries. So we, as players, kind of felt like we got the money thing situated. You know, we agreed to that. It's, that should be over with and done. But um, that seems to be showing its face again. And we thought we were just going to have to be dealing with, okay, how do we get baseball back on the field? Health, you know, for health and safety reasons, as you're seeing in Korea, they've basically been able to do it. And, um, you know, it seems like it's going to kind of come down to a, a fight over money, which stinks when there's 20 million plus people unemployed and you got millionaires fighting billionaires. But it kind of seems like that's the fight we got ahead of us. And we're kind of, it's crunch time. Right. I mean, if we're expecting to have a spring training 2.0 here in the next couple of weeks, I mean, we've got to get a deal moving right now. So hopefully by the time this podcast goes out, we, we have a deal done. And I, I sound like I'm talking about the past. <laughs> Ross, one of the unique aspects that you uh, guys are dealing with and Danny's uh, league is vastly different. They're discussing being in a bubble more than likely Orlando, maybe Vegas, maybe a combination of the two. With the MLB, from my understanding, at least the plan would be, for teams to go to different stadiums around the country. Is that something that alarmed you? For me, it seems alarming, but maybe the health and protocols that you guys have instilled uh, gives you a bit more confidence with a plan that like that. Sure. You know, we've kind of heard every proposal under the sun as, as far as what that's going to look like. The first one was a, a bubble one where they're going to send us all to Arizona. We were going to be quarantined in hotels without our families, without our kids. And some of our biggest names in baseball definitely were outspoken against that right off the bat. And we've kind of gotten away from that. Now it sounds like we're more in the boat of doing what you just touched on, which is playing at our home stadiums and playing like your eight to nine, 10 closest teams geographically. So being in LA, you know, we'll play up and down the West coast, maybe into Arizona and Colorado, and we won't even go to Miami and New York. You know, you won't risk those long, long distance uh, plane rides, but you know, you're still obviously you're traveling around the nation. So there are those risks. But I guess the thought is hotels have been 80 to 90 percent uh, unoccupied over the last few months. Right. They should be pretty clean. Uh, we fly private. We don't go into airports. We basically get off a plane and go right into a bus. So as long as the planes and buses are sanitized, um, you feel pretty safe. Uh, the thing that gets iffy and we don't really have an answer on is, let's say, we're the Dodgers and we're up in Seattle playing the Manor, Mariners or over in Arizona playing the Diamondbacks and someone gets sick. How do you get them home? You know, cause they can't go on a commercial flight ethically. You can't do that. Right. And they can't go back on our private flight and risk getting the whole team sick. So that's kind of been a thing. That's definitely been a battle so far on, on what's, you know, hopefully it doesn't happen, but kind of inevitably it does. Right. So what's, what's uh, how are we going to be able to cope with that? Wow. Uh, a lot of scenarios, a lot of different, I said, and obviously you're not allowed to give us everything that you uh, know or in the insight, which you probably don't have any insight. Everybody thinks that we know that what's going on. Like people yeah. come to me like, Oh, what's going on? I know just as much as you do, what you, what you're reading, what you're hearing on TV. We, we both spent some time in the, the G league, the minor league, you spent some time in it. We all know this, this pandemic affects everyone, especially those in the, the minor leagues or the leagues under or people overseas, not just here. Um, how badly can you, how can you describe or explain how badly this affects them? Yeah, I mean, it's monumental, right? It, our minor leagues, you don't make much money. And what's great is a lot of teams have come out and said they're at least going to pay their minor leaguers through, it's either through the end of May or June, you know, so at least they're getting a little bit of money that they were planning on getting because it's not much. So, but able, you know, being able to get it is certainly a big deal, but really you miss a year of development, man. And, and, Basketball players, you know, the G League is definitely about development, but, you know, you, it's, it's quicker, right? Usually you make it up to the NBA pretty fast, maybe a year or two. I mean, the minor leagues can take five, six years for some guys, especially to get drafted out of high school to make it to the big leagues. And missing out on a year of development and a year of getting your name out there and a year of, you know, um, trying to make it up to the big leagues is, is a huge deal and definitely feel for those kids. You know, some of them were – excited going into their first season or someone more excited thinking this is the year they're going to be able to make it and now they're just hoping they're one of the kind of what we're calling the taxi squad which are basically the extra guys that will be invited to hang out in Arizona or Florida 
and potentially make it to the big leagues when someone in the big leagues gets hurt. And, um, man, it's just, it's, it's tough on them for sure. And it may kind of fall to the wayside. You know, everyone talks about us and what our situation is, but you don't realize there's another 400 kids in every organization that's kind of in no man's land right now. They can't file for unemployment and they're just kind of stuck. So, um, yeah, I definitely feel for them. Tough, tough situation. Um, if you guys get back to playing, how many games do you want scheduled against the Astros? <laughs> I should have known this was going there, right? Um, <laughs> you know what's funny is it looks like it's going to happen no matter what, almost with every proposal we get, is that the NL West and the AL West, which are the Astros, are going to play each other because we're the closest geographically, right? The AL East will play the NL East, et cetera. And uh, so it looks like that's going to happen no matter what. So that'll be rowdy. I wish, I wish and hope that we can have fans in the stands when they come to L.A., because that'll certainly heighten the experience of that. But, you know, we're, we've kind of said all along we want to take care of business on the field. You know, we had some back and forth with them in our spring training. You saw, like, Correa and Bellinger going back and forth and their owner coming out and kind of saying some uh, basically borderline ignorant stuff. And that got us all fired up. And uh, obviously no one's happier now than the Astros that this quarantine thing happened, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, baseball fans aren't forgiving. They'll remember, and players are kind of the same. So we're excited to meet them on the field and, and take care of business there. Well, so I imagine there's a level of optimism going into the season before, obviously, all this happened with Mookie Betts, Mookie Betts coming to the team, David Price being added. Uh, where did you stand and where do you still stand in terms of bringing the pennant back to Los Angeles? Yeah, I tell you what, man we basically have a national league all-star team in our locker room. I mean, it's, it's crazy. We added another Cy Young winner and another MVP to an already really talented roster. So we're excited. I mean, we want to, we want to play. We don't care if it's 50 games or 150 games, you know, this roster wants to go out and play together and, and being around David Price and Mookie Betts in spring training was, was awesome. They're both really, really great guys, really good additions to the team. They're world series winners. So they're leaders in our locker room. And uh, obviously, they're going to make our team way better. So uh, we, we feel confident. You know, there's obviously a couple of juggernaut teams when you think of the Astros and the Yankees and, and others, you know, that certainly will stand in the way. And other teams in the National League, we got to get through too. But, man, we're, we're confident and we want to get out there and play. We don't feel like this, this year would be, you know, if you go win the World Series this year, that's not lesser of an achievement because it's a coronavirus year. You know, if anything, it might be a bigger achievement versus what all you had to go through to get there. So... Uh, we're excited. We hopefully hopefully get the opportunity. Agreed and same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Gosh, y'all. Uh, one of your teammates had such a good quote yesterday. I think it was Dudley. Maybe it's like, uh, you know, what is it going to be a disadvantage if you're not able to play in LA when all this comes back? And they're like, no, we got LeBron and AD. We got all the advantage in the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know how they like to put an asterisk next to next to teams that win during like lockout years or because they think, oh, it doesn't count. Um, I think it's even harder when it's a shorter season or when you have things you have to go through, uh, something like this to, to get there. So, you know, it very much counts um, whether you, you know, hopefully you get back and playing, but whether you get there or not in a shortened season or a pandemic season, uh, it doesn't count any less. Yeah, I got, I got a question for you, Danny. You know, the idea, we kind of never got started, right? Baseball, mm -hmm. we were just kind of in the build-up process of spring training. I mean, you guys played 75% of your season, Right. And now you're looking at taking months off. I mean, I saw something about tip, you know, tip off in July. Yeah, uh, that's that's pretty crazy. Like how, you know, I guess. How are you feeling? <laughs> yeah, no, it's <laughs> the a, interview. Yeah, no, it's a it's a lot to take. So it's, it's great to have a break because everybody said you, you enjoy your low, your break. Um, it's good to have like a week or two off when you're taking two months off, though. Um, it could be detrimental to the chemistry. Uh, and it, I think everybody's taking a hit, not just us. Uh, but it's it's weird, and we're hoping to start earlier than July. Um, it's looking good. Hopefully, like mid June would be nice. Uh, we're gonna need a couple weeks to get back in in rhythm, back in shape, playing shape, game shape. It's different. You can work out as much as you want, but you can't simulate a five on five uh, type of ordeal of being in shape. Um, so it, it's weird. Not we're probably not gonna have our summer uh, playing through the summer, um, and so it's kind of starting over uh, like toward the end of the season. Uh, so it's just a, it's a, it was a weird thing at first. Now guys are seeing the op being more optimistic about the situation. Now we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel where there's some things opening up, loosening up, and then they're finding some sites where we can get back playing. Um, and I think it's very important that we do get back playing because uh, we don't want things to change for the following season. And there's too much yeah. at risk to lose if we do if we do you know wash the season and, and 
cancel it. So we don't want to lose. Nobody wants to lose the season. Um, so yeah, it's it's great to get some rest, but at this point, it, it's too much rest, and, and it turns into rust, and it gets weird, and and it's a disadvantage, especially for teams that are older, um, and teams that were playing well chemistry wise. It takes time to get that that chemistry back. Yeah, for sure. We're we're kind of in that same boat where they're talking about pushing. Normally, Game Seven of the World Series is like November first. Mm. They're talking about pushing games back potentially like an extra month, and where the World Series could be around Thanksgiving. But then you start getting into the 2021 season. You know, most pitchers need that rest. It's it's a major workload, so you need that off season to get your rest. And you know, guys worry about how much their 2021 season will be affected by later play this year. And I'm sure you guys are kind of in that same boat. For, you know, Ross, you mentioned that. So I imagine if the World Series is going to be played around Thanksgiving time, it's only right that it's played in Los Angeles. I mean, the weather is going to be pretty crappy in like sure. Boston and New York, right? <laughs> yeah, that was brought up for sure. Definitely about making it in L.A. I think actually that exact proposal was given about basically starting the year in L.A. with like an all-star game. Just get like Mike Trout and Aaron Judge, like everyone, and just play like a really cool like all-star game in L.A. to kick off the season and then have the World Series in L.A. The thing about pushing it back that I think we're getting into is, is most people think that a coronavirus phase two can happen around next flu season, right, which is kind of getting into November, December. So if you push our season back, then you get into a chance of another shutdown, which means no postseason. And I think our owners are basically saying that they're going to make maybe half, half or more of their revenue just from the postseason this year and those TV deals that you get. So they can't risk a potential loss of the postseason from a coronavirus phase two. So we're kind of like, once again, we're just really back and forth on, on what we're hearing. Wow. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of things, man. I was hearing some things incorrectly. I know, <laughs> I know Magic owns part of the team, but I also hear that you're a licensed investment advisor. What are some of the things that you are looking into or have been investing in? And, you know, I guess myself and the average person should be looking into yeah, sure. Uh, this sounds like a great conversation to have after the fact. Give me, give me a text. I can help you out. Um, I can't get super specific because what can happen is if I say like go buy stock XYZ and someone mm -hmm. does it and it goes to zero, I can get sued, right? Well, just so, a general yeah, yeah. You know, of, oh, this is doing well, things like this and things like that. Right. So we're at zero percent interest rates, which historically means the bond markets will struggle and stocks will thrive, which are equities, right? Like buying equities in individual companies. Uh, so I think that's the place to be right now, which we've seen. Um, if anything, this quarantine has shown how reliant we are on e-commerce um, and on streaming services and on things in the cloud, right? Being able to advertise, being able to bank online, being able to uh, have cybersecurity and, and payment software, all this kind of stuff, right? Is, is just been heightened to the extreme during all this, as you've seen in most of those stocks, which have performed really well when actually the value stocks where you think of the blue chip companies of our economy have actually really struggled. They haven't put up like these growth companies have, um, which is actually kind of a weird situation. It's usually not like that. Usually the blue chip guys come back faster during crazy things like this. Um, so we're kind of seeing a switch in our economy. And um, man, good question. You know, I love talking about this. I could talk about it all day. Uh, it's, it's all good, man. I'm just, I yeah. was just trying to see doing a short interview here because I might have to hire you one of these. <laughs> I'm already impressed. Um, this is great. When did you have the time to get the, your license? Did you do this like during college or did you do this during a pandemic? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When yeah, did you so, have the time to do this? Good question. I had a Tommy John surgery. If you know what Tommy John is, it's kind of like an ACL surgery, but in your elbow, a lot of pitchers have it. And basically from the second they open you up, it's a year to 14 months of just no plan. Wow. And I was stuck in Arizona rehabbing my arm and I studied finance in college and got in great with a firm called B. Riley Wealth Management. And they licensed me. I had to take two giant tests, <laughs> um, barely passed each one, but I passed <laughs> and uh, that got me licensed. So basically had a 14 month kind of window there where I could get some stuff done. And that's what I did. That's awesome, man. Impressive. And it's a I might be looking to hire one of these days. So. <laughs> yeah. So just, with, just with a small amount that you've given us so far. So I'll let you two guys with the big money discuss stock markets after this. I'll let you guys discuss. I can't, I can't with y'all. Um, but Ross, before you go, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you do have a podcast. And if you do, please let us know about it so our, our audience can follow. I do. Yeah. It's called the Big Swing Podcast. Uh, you can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, 
Apple Pod, Spotify, all that good stuff. We definitely talk a lot of baseball, but we've had some NBA players on it as of late. Danny, we had Pat Connington and Harrison Barnes on there. We had uh, CJ, Mc- we had CJ McCollum on a few months ago. Always love talking hoops with those guys. I get to talk baseball all day, so it's nice to change it up every now and then. And nice, uh, yeah, it's nice. called the Big Swing Podcast. Danny, we'd we'd love to have you on there anytime. And now I put sure. it on this, and so now you have to do it for sure. For sure, man. Uh, whenever you need me, I'm there. Great. Uh, Sounds like I mean I haven't watched baseball and I thought so we can talk hoops but um I don't know a ton about baseball you can teach me some things man I still need to learn but so hopefully you guys get back up and running get a deal done so I can can watch and learn some more soon um, but thanks thanks again man thanks a ton for taking the time out and joining us said so stay safe hopefully your family is safe um, and continue to you know stay ready I guess and hope for the best. Yeah, you too, man. Let's, uh, let's bring two championships back to L.A. this year. That would be nice. That would be nice. Yeah. What's up? What's up? Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's Inside the Green Room presented to you by Jack in the Box. I'm Danny Green, my co-host Harrison Sanford, and we'll be lucky to be welcomed by the one and only Mike Epps. What's up, my man? How you doing, man? What's up, Green? What's up, Green? Thanks for having me in the green room, baby. Nah, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you coming on. I know you're having some te- technical difficulties with the uh, headphones, but I uh, appreciate you jo- joining on, man. I-, I just made that up. I don't know if you're the one and only, but I'm sure there's probably uh, more than one Mike Epps. But congratulations. <laughs> heard you had a new baby. Yeah, I got right. a new baby, Green. You know what I mean? Over here doing baby baby duties. That's what's you're doing up, the man. quarantine. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> congrats, man. Congrats. I'm sure it's a... It's a hell of a time to have a baby, but uh, you get to spend some time home with them. Uh, with, with the, That's the, the best one. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you have any new and upcoming projects coming out soon? Yeah, man. I'm supposed to be playing for the Lakers next year, man. <laughs> so I'm trying to get back together, man. Uh, I, I young, saw a young kid over there named Green. They talking about me replacing him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw uh, – <laughs> I saw uh, you had you uh, with the uh, – the, the mustache and the, and, the, and the outfit. You're looking like a, a, a essay, man, from Friday. You look like one of the essays from Friday. Yeah, man, I'd be messing around. You know what I mean? I I was trying to get my goatee right, but I messed it up. And then I just end up with a big old mustache. Somebody said I look like Steve Harvey the other night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh. I messed against Steve Harvey. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, what's... Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, Mike, what's been the most challenging part about trying to take care of a newborn during the quarantine? Well, you know, that's the thing, man. I was just telling some a friend of mine, I said, you know, unfortunately, we've had some, 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 some bad stuff that has happened during this time, man. People have lost their lives and stuff. But on, on the bright side, because it's always a bright side of some things, too, is that People are getting a chance to stay home and get rest and, and figure things out and recharge. And, you know, they say the air is clean. And I've been on the road for 20 years, man. It's, I've never had a chance to even be had doing nothing on a Saturday. Yeah. You know, I haven't had a Saturday off in 20 some years. So the fact that I had a brand new baby come in, I said, man, what better time to be off? Yeah, you man. That's, that's your baby's life. You know what I mean? That's amazing, man. That's amazing. Um, it's a blessing. So we don't get many uh, days off or be at home for this long and not be on the road. Uh, speaking. Don't of, you feel that way a little bit too? Oh, Greg? Yeah, man. Even in the summertime, I'm I'm never at home for this long. I'm always moving. I'm always going somewhere. There's always something up, something happening where I have to be. If I'm home longer than a week or two and I have nothing right. going on, I already feel like I have to move. Whether it's something going <laughs> yeah. on, I have to move. You got um, the move, yeah, yeah. But uh, speaking of sports, man, I know you're a, a Pacers fan. Um, yeah. Give me your top Pacers teams in the past that, that you were the biggest fans of, your most favorite Pacers, Indiana Pacers teams. Oh, man, you know, you talking to a real Pacers fan. I go all the way back to, uh, you know, Wayman Tisdale and, <laughs> and, and, and Reggie and, uh, you know, Derek McKee's of the world. Yeah, the Davis brothers. Yeah, Derek McKee. Come on, man. <laughs> you seem like a pacer to me, Green. <laughs> That's another day for another story, but. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
for sure. So speaking of your speaking of your ties to Indiana, I I don't know if you're a Hoosier fan or not, but Danny's younger brother Devonte played for um, IU. was it uh, Archie Miller and IU for the past uh, couple of years here, past four years. So my yeah, Archie, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm already fan. up on that. Oh man, I'm a big <laughs> Hoosier fan. I, I I love all anything Indiana, man. You know that's that's my thing. It ain't a lot of people from Indiana in the business, so I just I just love sticking to it. You know what I mean? That's what's up, man. That's what's up. Um, speaking of uh, not much, you know, not many things left of, you know, hidden talents or left of the tsunami people from Indiana in the business. Um, growing up, what were some of the things that you in Indiana like to do, love to do? Um, you know, obviously we've seen you roller skating lately around the, around the crib. Um, <laughs> when did you, you know, when did you take an interest in that and when did that become like one of your things to do and is that is there some other things like that that you did as a kid growing up oh yeah well you know you know danny and that's the thing man you know uh you know sometimes the kids uh uh they don't understand i told i used to tell my kids all the time i said man you know, unfortunately the way the world is now man you guys don't get to go outside and play as much as we did but we really didn't, we couldn't afford to uh, have some of the toys and some of the big uh, go-karts and mini bikes and stuff. We had to make all of our fun. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we made bicycles, we made go-karts, we made, we made all of our fun, man. So I ended up learning how to do everything, trying to have some fun, you know, roller skating, anything has some wheels on it. If you live in the hood, <laughs> you want to use it. I don't <laughs> You want to ride out, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Mike, so I know I how to ride a unicycle. Yeah, a ride... unicycle. Yeah, I ride a unicycle, you oh, know what I mean? Shit. Wow. I haven't yeah, seen anything with wheels. Motorcycle, <laughs> unicycle, cars, trucks, anything. Wow. Mike, I've seen your IG live and it's uh it's been entertaining and uh it's Thank also you, been and it's also been wholesome. Um I'm only saying that because there's some other IG lives that have gone public. I don't know if you know them or not. <laughs> you been, uh, on there, you? <laughs> have you seen, uh, is there, there's a certain sur one that I'm not going to mention the name if you haven't seen it, but I think you might know what I'm talking about. There's a, uh, a Tory Lanez uh, IG live. Have you, have you, oh, man, Tory Lanez. Have you, have you heard of him? I have you heard about that him? I've seen him. I've seen him. He's a <laughs> fool on there. <laughs> The quarantine radio, huh? We can leave it. We can leave it at that. We can leave it at that. Hey, um, look at here, man. They, hey, check it out. It's all for grabs now. They ain't not, everybody's just at home doing nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's all entertainment. Everybody's entertaining and having a good time, man. They, and some people going to the max with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> what, would a, what would a young Mike Epps would have said back when back in your days if you would have seen what, what Instagram and social media is now? What, what do you have said? Or done. Or done. Yeah. I, oh God! I what I the first thing I would have said is I first thing I would have said is God is good. <laughs> I'm so glad that He provided us with all this entertainment. And <laughs> <laughs> That's what the young dumb Mike Gibbs would have said. <laughs> the God made. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I would have done? Oh man, ain't no telling what I would have done. I'd have probably been on that. Uh, you know what I mean? Acting the fool, doing what Tory Lanez is doing. <laughs> for well, sure. well, for those of you that was number five years ago. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for those who haven't seen, uh, we'll let you find it by yourselves. Um, so, uh, Tory, uh, uh, Mike, you did a. Yeah. You were you made an appearance, a couple appearances. You were frequent uh, guest or actor, I would say, on one of LeBron's series, Survivor's Remorse. What was, the, yeah. what was that experience like and, and, and what did you take, take from it? Uh, well, you know, that was, that was a great experience, man. Uh, uh, LeBron James uh, put together a television call, show called Survivor's Remorse that I really, really enjoyed working on and I really enjoyed the premise of it, the storyline. Michael Malley wrote it. And it's called Survivors of Morse. So this is something that we can all re relate to. You know, anybody that's successful, green, 
I'm pretty sure you could relate to this, uh, being successful. So everybody has survivor's remorse. So that's what the show was about. And uh, it was it was great working on it. You know, unfortunately, I had another opportunity to come along and I couldn't continue to work on the show. But the time that I did work on it, I had a great time. Are there any other Netflix shows that you're watching right now or, or tapping into or any projects you're looking forward to maybe trying to jump into or doing or ventures? Well, I actually have a Netflix show on that I'm filming, that we were filming before the quarantine called The Upshaw, me and Wanda Sykes uh, and Kim Field uh, is, we doing a show, a family show that's on Netflix that's going to be airing next year, so. Uh, it's called The Upshaw, you said? The Upshaws. The, uh, okay. And it's, it's called you... The Upshaws, yeah. Me, okay. Wanda Sykes, Kim Field. It's, it's, it's a good show, man, a good family show, so make okay. sure y'all tune into that. It's kind of like a a, a, a Sanford and Son type show. It's it's okay. really cool. For sure, for but, sure. Uh, um, before we let you go, uh, we have one fun one uh, we want to get into. We recently spoke to Ron Artest a couple of days ago. He talked about his first time winning a championship, or when he won a championship, and his celebration story of how he was in five, ten different clubs, uh, kept his jersey on, had the finger tape on, still was in the studio with Dr. Dre, dropped the track, we can't find the track. Um, the celebration was unrelievable. But he did, he did drop a track, huh? I think they have a track somewhere. They got it. Do um, you have any interesting or f funny or fun, the, the craziest celebration stories you've ever had when you made it? When was it the turning point for you when you felt like I made it? And what was that celebration like? Well, you know what? My, I always tell people my celebration was I bought my mother a washer and dryer. She always <laughs> wanted a washer and dryer. And uh, when I bought the washer and dryer, I actually went down to, uh, it was a paint shop, a Mexican paint shop down there uh, in Inglewood. I went down there just to show you how ghetto I was. I was going to have him candy paint and wash it dry. <laughs> uh, I said it to my mom. That's what's up, It was going to be man. like a lime now and later green candy paint. <laughs> wow, man. That's a hell of a celebration, man. Get some wheels on it. Get some rims. <laughs> do it all up. Move it around. Um, you know what I mean? <laughs> Mike, uh, actually, speaking of Ron Artest, and I would be remiss not to ask you, where were you oh, the, when, the fight? <laughs> when the fight happened? And give me the play-by-play -play of thoughts that were going down in your mind when the fight was taking place. Ron, Ron Artest, Jermaine O'Neal, Stephen Jackson. Ben Wallace. Was you in the arena during that time? Or you, was you on TV? Was you nah, watching it? No, I, I remember watching it, and I was just like, I was, at first I was like, yeah, Indiana! Let him know, let him know, Indiana! And I'm like, wait a minute, this is getting a little crazy right here. But I seen them fighting the fans, I was like, oh, Lord! I like, oh, well, they gotta stop the band. I'm thinking they need to start boom, 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 boom! Yeah. You know what? That's, 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 that's the epitome of, you know, hardcore sports sometimes, mm -hmm. man. It ain't no different than hockey, you know, I guess because basketball plays, but sometimes it gets intense, man. And, and from my recollection of watching the NBA, they've been fighting hard like that forever. That's the old school days, man. Old school days, how they used to be. It used to, uh, well, I wouldn't say allow it, but it wasn't as much of a punishment when there was fights. So, That's right. I seen Shaq just. I'm like, what? If one of these kids would have hit that man, you know. So I mean, you know, it was it was all in, in fun and sports. In Indiana and Detroit, they always been rivals on the basketball court. So it it was all good for sports in the end, man. And I know we'll never forget about it, man. But go Pacers, you know what I'm saying? For sure. I know you're a Laker, but uh, go Pacers. <laughs> speaking sure. of speaking of Pacers, uh, I know Danny and I had talked about this before. Uh, yeah. what I know you're a Pacer fan, so it's cool if you're if you're being honest and, and you don't agree with the sentiment. <laughs> uh, uh, Victor Oladipo is often featured uh, for his musical talents. Yeah, there's been some. How, how? What are your thoughts on some of those performances? I mean, you know, the thing of it is that I'm a I'm a comedian and I do other things too. You know, I didn't put okay. the music out. It's all fun, you know. It's like some people gonna like it and some people ain't. I th I think it's cool. I think it's him just having a good time, you know. And 
I can't even grade it because, you know, he's so good at what he do on the court. It's like, I know he's just having a good time, <laughs> you know, but, but it's good because he's actually going for it. For sure. He's talented. He's very talented. But the, be the behind the scenes, the backstory to this is Harrison has awesome. a weird thing with all Victor Aldebo because his, his ex-girlfriend <laughs> had a crush on him. So he doesn't like Vic for some odd reason. Hey, and man, we Vic know is, how that could go. Yeah, and when Vic's putting out R&B albums and it's only making him more appealing to his girlfriends. You know what I'm saying? He's, That's he's the thing. Not, <laughs> I've been there before. I've been there, bro. It's I've been there. You play your basketball. If he was, if, if I thought he was really good singer, that's cool. But, you know what I'm saying? Don't, like... You want him, you want him to stay in his lane. Stay in his lane. Oh, and if man. you want to get outside the lane, please, you know what I'm saying, be up to that level of where people are. Yeah, you know yeah, I can, I can, I can dig. I'm that. not trying to hate. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just. I was. Anyways, I was... he'll get over it, man. <laughs> yeah, but, man, uh, you know the game for sure. Your girl um, chose him. Well, it looks like uh, we having some technical difficulties uh, with Mike Epps, but we appreciate him having having him, you know, take his time out on the show. Uh, so, Mike, I know if you're watching or listening, man, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Hopefully, your family and loved ones are safe in Indiana and here and everywhere else uh, around the world. Thank you for the time, man. Uh, appreciate it uh, having such a legend on, uh, you know, comedic legend, uh, a legend in the acting field. Uh, you're amazing, man. So we really appreciate you. Thank you. We're back with more Inside the Green Room with Danny Green. That's Danny Green you see on your screen. Cheer, cheer. Hope you know me by now. Uh, and joining us is <laughs> London Wilmot, the creative director and image consultant for a number of... Uh, high profile uh, people in the entertainment industry. And if you ever see Danny with the fire fit, it's probably because of her. And if you yep. don't see him with one, it's probably not her. So <laughs> welcome <laughs> you to the show. What up, what up, what's going on? Appreciate you taking the time out, London. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you on the show and actually you know, be able to chance to give an insight on how you pick out certain brand stylists to work with certain athletes uh give the fans the viewers uh some background on, on how guys come in through the tunnel uh, speaking of let's say the first question basically um is that you know how do the fashion and brands you know work together um to outfit like athletes um so yeah for us i mean the process starts really far back i think a lot of people just see like what happens on instagram and they're mm -hmm. like yeah you know, that outfit has just been placed together. Um, for me personally, uh, I watched the shows previously, like the season previously. Mm -hmm. um, and then I look for looks that I'm interested in. Um, then what I do is I do my market research. Um, I check the market, um, see what fits my clients. I have a list of what brands that I feel like my, my client connects with, what I feel like is more their style. Mm -hmm. And then what I do is reach out to the brands and see, obviously, you know, if you're in entertainment, you know, they definitely, like, love you to rock their stuff. Um, so, you know, I send out an email, see what is available. Um, and then we kind of, like, collaborate together on, like, what looks are available. Um, if it's more of, like, a higher tier uh, brand, they definitely want you to go exactly by their look the same mm -hmm. way it went down the runway. Um, if it's a street brand, you can play around with it a little bit more. Um, sometimes you can pull up to the studio um, and just check out what you want. And um, I kind of just freestyle and uh, hmm. what, what I love to see, uh, I like to mix high and low. So like you're going to see a lot of that. I definitely do a lot of streetwear and then mix in some high end as well. So that, that's interesting. I was I wanted to always ask that and know that like, how do you make sure that you don't, you know, copy like, or co like do an outfit that has been in the past. So you've done research from a year prior to see outfits and see what they made and make sure you don't do those outfits, but something similar, but something in your style that you like, and then pretty much reach out to the brands and see who's interested in what athletes in, I would say the higher brands, you said they have to wear it that date. They want to make sure that it's pitched out during this time because they're releasing it and they want it to be pubs uh, for that time and the exact full outfit. Um, wow. Didn't know so much detail went into it, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but go ahead, uh, H, I'm yeah. sure you got to, Oh, I got a bunch of questions. So, London, uh, real quick for the people who are listening or, or watching, just run off some of the people that you've worked with in the past or currently working with so that they can maybe start stealing some ideas from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so before I was actually housed with brands. Um, so I started off at Ralph Lauren and then like, you know, built my way into Rag and Bone, Louis Vuitton and Dover Street Market. So over there, I was able to work with like, I mean, a whole list of uh, uh, celebrities. Um, I think that's really where it kind of started my relationship um, was that they trusted me because I was at, you know, high end brands. Um, and so right now, I feel like my connection has been really in the NBA world. Um, I do have an entertainment client that, you know, is a comedian. Um, but I, I would say right now, um, just when it comes to just like physique and the way people are just designing things now, I just love how it looks on a basketball player. Um, just because, I mean, people don't even really think about it. Like a lot of the models are normally like 5'11 plus. <laughs> so like. <laughs> You know what I mean? So a lot of the, you know, the smaller guys do want to wear like that Givenchy or, you know, that Dior jacket, but it's like, they have to roll the sleeves up. They got to do this. Like, you know, they got to do a little bit more to make it look good. Um, but right now, um, who I'm working with and who I have worked with, uh, De'Aaron Fox, obviously Danny Green, uh, Dwight Howard, Mike Epps, uh, Jayla Darden. She's a new artist. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, she does everything herself. Um, and yeah, I help out TJ Warren as well on the Pacers. Um, and a lot of people I just help with, with personal shopping as well. You know, sometimes it's not necessarily like me putting the whole outfit together. Sometimes it's locating something for them, um, finding something for them or asking a brand to make something for them, um, personally, because sometimes as well for a basketball player, you do need a little bit more like inches on a pair of pants or something like that. So you know, it's just creating that relationship with the brand and, and the client. Um, and I think I've been able to do that well uh, with the clients that I have right now. Dope, dope. Big shout out to Mike Epps. He was on, he joined us on the show uh, recently. Yeah. Had some technical difficulties, uh, technical difficulties uh, with the mic and headphones and obviously some of the Wi-Fi shortage, but uh, he was great. He was awesome. Um, so outside of your people you work for, non-biased question, who do you think are the best dress athletes and why? Um, okay. So when it comes to style, I, I really love like tailored suiting. Okay. Um, and I love that with like a pair of sneakers. So I would say my first guy I would go to would be David Beckham. I love her style. Okay. I think like that he's just super timeless. I mean, just since his twenties up until now, he's just evolved. And I think his style is like phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think soccer players are the best ath just athletes or no? They, they are some of the best dress yes okay. say and <laughs> like honestly it's because I feel like a lot of them are from Europe <laughs> and okay. so it's like the style like I mean it's just like I like a lot of stuff that fits a little bit tighter uh mm -hmm. fit it. like you know what I mean it's just like I, over here it's like you know I mean the hip-hop edge is amazing depending on you know what it is but I feel like I love a lot of just the Ralph Lauren for sure for um, sure. suiting that you know Beckham wears and like I mean when he's in like a three-piece Dior suit like that's just flames like it's hard so yeah. Yeah, America goes with what the wave is during that time, and it could be baggy. And now it's kind of mixed. You can mix it up, baggy type. But the European style has come over, and guys have started doing it, using it more, and copying the European style more in the last, in the last decade or so. Um, right, right. They right. Have, definitely originated over there. Those, I can't knock it. Those guys definitely have fashion. H, you want to jump in here? Yeah, right. London. Can I tell you a gripe that I have? Yeah. So I was. I mean, I talked to Danny. It must have been earlier this year. We were talking about him and uh, being on the runway or like the runway going to a game. And I got really upset because I'm a normal person. And he was talking about, oh yeah, bro, you can't wear something more than once. You know how it goes. I'm like, yo, is there a way we could, we could alter this? Because let's well, face it, it's, listen, it's, it's <laughs> let's if I was face in a different, it. If I was in a different city, I would probably be wearing something more than once. But yeah, being in LA, yeah. there's cameras and, and, and lights and everything everywhere. They document every outfit you wore, and you wear it again. They're gonna document it again. But people are gonna be like, "Didn't you yeah. wear it before?" <laughs> in LA, you ain't gonna be able to do that twice, man. No, you, can. you can't, Harrison. You can. You're with the media. You know what I'm saying? You got a nice little mixture of different colors and flows. You know, they're not gonna be tagging you. Remember every outfit you got, so you're gonna look fresh. I'm gonna have to rerun some stuff, man. It's gonna look come a point. I'm gonna have to rerun some stuff. Like I want to, and I want to be able to post on Instagram with it more than once, and I have people yeah. looking at me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's it, it's crazy, you know, how these guys, I mean, they have to like recycle it out. Like it has to be a process and you have to be on it. You have to make sure they don't wear the same thing twice. Um, 
So it's, yeah, you, I, I feel like, you know, same thing Danny's saying, if you're in LA, man, you just, you just got to do what LA does. <laughs> you got to go with the vibe, man. Part of the flag, yeah. You look crazy if you are wearing, you know, re wearing the same outfits a couple of times throughout the year. And I'm like, yo, he wore, this is, must be his favorite pair of pants. Yeah. <laughs> so, so speaking of, you know, speaking of, you know, styling people and, and outfits and sometimes, has there been a situation before or have you heard stories before or you've been in a situation before where you tried to give somebody a look and they, and it was maybe too outlandish for them or they couldn't <laughs> play it off or they did it. They, cause obviously in order to take some of these styles, you got to, be outlandish and sometimes guys aren't ready to get there just yet they can see something that they like but the second they think about putting it on their body they're like ah wait a second yeah i don't know if i can yeah. do that basically how do you like make sure you let the, the client's personality show through their style yeah. without pushing them outside their boundaries type of thing too much yeah i i think for me definitely i already kind of like gauge with my clients like i feel like we we kind of collaborate on it together. And I think that's really important when you're addressing someone is really finding out what they're interested in. And I normally just take a little peep of their closet before mm -hmm. and uh, kind of see what they do wear and what, you know, you know, patterns they're interested in and like ways I can like elevate their style without taking them completely left. Um, so I think, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's important to, to, to be on top of it when it comes to that, especially when dressing guys, like you can't take them like, you know, I think with women, you can kind of like experiment a bit, but like with guys, like you just got to know which guys are not interested in pink and you know, all those other crazy things. Um, but so, I, I would say, go ahead. I would say for the clients I have now, they're just, they're a little bit spontaneous. They, uh -huh. you know, they try different so things. So I'm not the only one that says, ah, when certain outfits come out, I'm not the only person that'd be like, I don't know if I could do this one. Yeah, no, you're not the only right. person. Like, no, there's some fits where, you know, sometimes it's just like, oh, yeah, it looked better on the model or the mannequin. And it's like, I don't know if it's an everyday thing. Even when you look at it. But sometimes I'm like, man, I don't know if I – so, Harrison, yes, to answer your question, brother, there's some outfits that I'd be like – I don't say hell no anymore. <laughs> I used to be like, oh, hell no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> this is back when I used to, you know, wear the, the baggier pants. No, not as much fitted, you know, as tight yeah. now. Now everybody wears pants. You can see their veins and, and uh, leg hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, so I'm like, I don't, know if I, could, I don't know if I could do that. You know, before I was like, nah, hell no, I can't do this. There's no way that's going to happen. So the, another question I wanted to ask you, uh, London, and I recently I saw a suit that I had been uh, working on with some guys, some friends in Toronto. And I was like, man, what is that time I'm going to dress up again? And I was <laughs> I'm wondering, like, how many outfits do you have on deck ready to go once the world returns back? A lot. Move. Yeah, I know you've been trying to get some, uh, everybody's trying to get some fits off. I know that. Yeah. Man, yeah, no, I have them a stack and ready to go. And the crazy <laughs> thing is, is that, I mean, we, I mean, we just had fits just like piled up ready. Cause I mean, this was the go time, you know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, even, and, the, and they're still dropping stuff. So it's, it's kind of crazy. It's like, you know, what, what are we going to do when the time goes? It's like switch fits like in between the day. Yeah, the mask is going to have to become a uh, mandatory accessory now to the fit. <laughs> no, yeah. And it's going to be interesting uh, where fashion is going to go. It's like, are people going to just like revenge buy and just go crazy and, you know, <laughs> go into the stores because they haven't been able to shop in so long? Because some people are really like, they, they love itching. to shop. Like, that's yeah, what they need. The yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look good when I get out here, man. It's so, I'm so <laughs> the when, when you get out, when I get out, I'm trying to, you know, it's the first day out. I'm trying to look good. <laughs> so real. Question, questions for the regular people for Harrison, I wouldn't say I'm saying regular people, but as he calls himself, <laughs> that, that likes to wear stuff twice more than once. Um, he wants, they want to know, the fans want to know, like how can regular people dress like professional athletes, but at a lower cost? Um, I would say if you're a person that wants to dress like an athlete and you do not have the budget, then you just have to dress out of season. Mm -hmm. um, you can still look mm. good, but it would just be out of season. You can just grab stuff on sale. I mean, there's so many like online uh, brands that have amazing sales. Like Essence is one of them. I mean, phenomenal. I mean, you can get stuff like 40, 30 percent off and it's the same. Uh, Drees, like anything, St. Laurent, anything's on there. Um, and I think that would be like my suggestion for someone that didn't have a huge budget. Can't lie. Can't lie. I, when, honestly, when I, was, I would, I would say, you know, 
Sorry, Harrison, go ahead. Can no, 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 you can, I, well, can the reg, little regular person talk? Go ahead, man. <laughs> <laughs> I can't lie. When I was, I was in Portland uh, in the fall, and in Portland it gets cold. So they had a whole bunch of summer shorts, T-shirts, at like banana and all these stuff. They laid them off like 40%. Banana but in LA, <laughs> they're not doing that. So I was in Portland. I was, get, I was going in because I was like, oh, yeah. they're not going to wear these for another six, seven months. In LA, exactly. you wear it all year round. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm on to you, London. I'm on to you. Yeah, out of season. Sure. <laughs> right. He's ready Anyways, to bro. Anyways, please let everybody know where they can find you, London. Um, your brand. Yes. Uh, tell them about your brand, how long you've been working on it, um, your page, yes. your Instagram, your website, et cetera. Uh, please let everybody know um, where they can find you. Yes. So my Instagram is Risha Noir. It's R I C C O N O I R. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my main page. And I also have Risha Noir Studios. That's my brand. Uh, check me out. I've been working on it um, since 2014. I came up with the name and it's just been a lifestyle for me. And now I'm just adding in some merch. And uh, just placing out some of my, my friends, my good people, my clients. Um, and it's really just, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle. Um, it's, it's more to it than uh, just the clothing. So hopefully this year and onward, uh, I can show that to y'all. For sure, it's dope. And you'll catch me wearing a lot of her stuff, um, especially the travel stuff. The sweats and stuff is amazing. Um, some of my favorite stuff to wear when I'm traveling. Um, even one of my favorite ones actually didn't have pockets, but um, it's nice. It's really comfortable stuff. We and, upgraded that for you. Yeah, I, I, I need them. <laughs> you got it coming. It. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, you giving guys, people man. insight on the fashion world. You don't just do fashion, you do art. We know you're an artist <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day. Um, yes, and I'm uh, looking forward to getting back to the normal where we can get some outfits and I can show the rest of the world uh, some of the stuff you can put together. <laughs>